In this episode, I am rejoined by my coach, the amazing Jeff Mask. Um, and today, uh, we're going to talk specifically about the lessons he's learned, the biggest mistakes he's seen made by founders, CEOs, empire builders. Um, and Jeff's worked with clients ranging from seven figure, multi seven figure businesses, all the way up to his biggest client is an 80 billion with a B dollar company. So, um, Jeff, thanks for joining us. <laughs> so happy to be here. Hello, everybody. Buckle up for an amazing ride today. This is going to be a unique and powerful session. I, I can already feel it. So happy to be here. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, for, for sure. Completely agree. And um, I'm going to dive right in. I have learned as I've often shared, learn so much from this man, uh, not just about business, but, you know, um, changes, shifts I've made in my personal life, in my relationships. Um, so I really do owe uh, a debt of gratitude to Jeff. So the very least I can do is um, share his message or facilitate the sharing of his message with the world, which I think is a powerful one uh, and one that um, the world really needs to hear. So um, Jeff, first off, You've coached, as I said, founders, CEOs, leaders of companies all over the world, um, the US, Europe, Australia, the Far East, mm. from every different industry, every different background, different sizes of businesses. What do you see as some of the, the most common mistakes that CEOs, founders, leaders make when it comes to leading people? Yeah, in the early stages, and I, I define early um, pre ten million pounds. Let's say, um, in the in those earlier stages, I see the biggest bottleneck in the business being the leader. Meaning, it's really hard for the CEO to relinquish control and to not be a bottleneck in their business. Why? Because really? Blood... I, really? I have no idea what you're talking about. You're saying that. Business owners and entrepreneurs and CEOs like have control issues. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah for sure. And let's let's rewind and, and discover why. Because we know intimately the blood, sweat, and tears that was required to get to where we are. And it was scary in the early days. I mean, still it's scary. But initially, when you are in full-on survival mode, it is no joke. And it it is it can be potentially traumatic. And there are there are there are a little bit of inklings of post-traumatic stress that come in. That's one of the reasons why we can't relinquish control because we're worried that if we do, it'll fail and we'll go back to where we were. So yes, learning how to, con uh, how, how to trust in your people, learning how to let go, realizing that, that the single greatest inhibitor to growth in your business is you. <laughs> that it's the biggest, biggest realization and it's really hard to do. And, and often it's a blind spot. People just don't see it because you're just so focused on survival and growth and you're so scared subconsciously and sometimes consciously of, of what it used to be. Yeah, for sure. And so you skimmed over a little word that we've spoken a lot about um, and that's trust and right. building trust within a company, within a team. And I think the mistake people make when they think about this is yeah i trust my people i trust right. that they're not gonna steal from me i trust right. that they're gonna you know work hard and show up on time um and that's not i know that's not really what you're talking about when you're talking about trust so explain the concept of trust to yeah. the listeners the viewers Be, like explain it in the way that i now understand it because it's very different for sure yeah i'm glad you made that distinction it isn't about, are you going to nick my wallet? It's about vulnerability-based trust. And why this is so critical, there's actually a lot of data and a lot of science behind this. This goes back to a, a, a landmark study done by Google in 2008. It, it was then called Project Oxygen that's been renamed. But in essence, the hypothesis of the story was, uh, of the study was, what makes the best, perf highest performing teams? And their hypothesis, that was the question. The hypothesis was, high performing individual contributors make the highest performing teams. So all-star players create all-star teams. That was the hypothesis that was completely debunked and, and nullified. 
What they found and discovered was the number one contributor to high high performing teams was psychological safety and ability to innovate, to, to problem solve, to fail and to not have fear of retribution, to not have finger pointing, to not find out who was who was at fault. Instead, it was when a, when a problem happened, they asked questions like, oh, what did we learn here? So, okay, all that's based in trust, vulnerability-based trust, that I know my teammate has my back. I know that my leader sees the best in me. I know that we can be vulnerable together. For example, I don't know the answer and I'm the leader. And it's okay to raise my hand and say, I don't know. Whereas old school leadership would have said, no, as a leader, never show that quote unquote weakness because people won't trust you. It's actually the inverse, especially today. Or it's, I, I'm not sure how to figure this out. Can you help me? Actually asking for help of each other. That's the type of trust we're talking about. And the momentum is powerful and, and nearly unstoppable when you can create and cultivate that level of trust in your business. So how would somebody know if someone's listening to this, watching this, they're a founder, they're a CEO, they lead people. How would somebody be able to identify whether or not they have built a culture of psychological safety, of, yeah. of vulnerability-based trust? Beautiful. A simple litmus test, when, the, when a mistake is made, do we naturally think and or say, whose fault was that or who was owning that project? when something falls and fails? Or do we say, wow, what did we learn from that? That's one little simple indicator. Another bigger, a little bit, a, a visual that I like is a, is a really powerful model that Patrick Lencioni created years ago that I followed and, and have implemented in many businesses over the last, over, over a decade, called the five dysfunctions of a team. And in essence, he realized in, in his 25 years of consulting businesses around the world, there are five components that are that are present in a dysfunctional team in that the, one, the foundation is there's an absence of trust, meaning there isn't vulnerability. Um, the second one is there's a fear of conflict. In other words, people kind of mask it, no pun intended, and they, they put, um, you know, they're artificially harmonious. They're like, oh, everything's okay, but they don't really talk about the real issues. The other one is that one, that one, by the way, yeah. I think is well Huge. worth diving into. Um, <laughs> here's the reason I can say this. Um, and I think um, when I talk to clients, members of our masterminds about this principle, it's quite common, especially in smaller businesses, that our first team members, employees tend to be people we know, friends, family, in my case, you know, right people I went to school with, family members right. that I knew. And so often that actually makes it, in my experience, a little bit more difficult and challenging. For sure. Be but the, the irony is because there is actually what you would think is trust, because you know each other really well, it actually yeah. makes it more difficult um, <laughs> to embrace conflict. And so I certainly was guilty of this with people in my company who were close to me, family, friends, Mm -hmm. I, I, we definitely had what you call, I think brilliantly, artificial harmony. Right, right, definitely. And, you know, uh, my, my background, for those that aren't aware, I've, I've built different businesses, I've led different businesses, I've consulted with different businesses simultaneously in, in building a couple businesses. I went back to school to get an MBA in a global setting. And so I studied, studied global business and global cultures and, and, and uh, local communication styles and there are different parts of the world that that are more naturally prone to look at conflict and, and and look at it head on for example you do business with a german or with a russian you're not gonna they're right they're right in conflict they have zero hesitation you do business with someone in the uk for example or in latin america and it's very nicey nicey you dance around that you you avoid because you don't want to be too direct and, and it's really tough to figure out how, how to do that. So it's already hard enough as human beings, but then there are certain cultures that make it even harder. And most that are listening right now are in the UK culture and are nodding going, yeah. <laughs> I don't say it directly because I don't want to be rude. You know, I don't want to be a jerk, but 
I'm not saying directness, you need to be a jerk, but there's a way to address conflict in a healthy way that actually illuminates the problem when you solve with the individual versus making it combative against the individual. There's an art to, do, to doing that. What, what's interesting, um, we've never really had this conversation before. I would say that most people, most people would say that they are honest people. Yes. Like they're not going to tell lies. But the same people that say they're honest people won't speak their truth. There's a difference between Correct. being dishonest and not speaking your truth. But I yes. think a lot of times we say, I'm not dishonest. But the truth is they're not speaking their truth. In other words, they're not having those, yeah. as we call it, awkward conversations. And they're, right. they're practicing artificial harmony and they're in massive fear of conflict. Yeah. And I think you're right. I can say this yeah. as a Brit. I think in the right. UK, it's kind of culturally in society, we do avoid, move away mm -hmm. from conflict in a way that maybe isn't always the case in other countries. Right, definitely. And, and here's a good, here's, if you're wondering, I don't know, do I do this? Do I not? Here's a great example to think about. When you're with your leadership team, are people speaking the same way together than when you're one-on-one -on -one together and someone's speaking about somebody else? If they're speaking differently in a group setting than they are individually, that's a great indicator. Hmm, maybe we're not speaking our truth the way that we think we are. And by the way, I'm going to bet right now that in 99.9% .9 of companies, the conversations that are happening in private between the leaders of the business are different, either subtly different or very different. Right. The conversations that are happening in the leadership team. We, we've done a lot of work on this in the last couple of years in, in my companies and even now, and I think we've made massive progress, but even now, still, there'll be the odd conversation um, yeah. where a leader comes to me with something and that conversation is not happening when there are other leaders present in the room. And so right. um, that that's definitely a telltale sign. I think you've, you've illustrated that brilliantly. Yeah. And in most companies, I'm going to bet that the conversations that are having in private are very different than the conversations mm -hmm. we're having in a group. And that would point to artificial harmony. Very different. Yep, definitely. So that's the second part of it. We'll, we'll kind of uh, breeze through the others. The art, lack of, the, the fear of conflict then trickles down to lack of commitment because you haven't been able to work through issues. So therefore, when you, when you determine on something, there isn't overarching commitment because people haven't voiced their concerns. In other words, weigh in enables more buy-in. But when there isn't conflict, people aren't, aren't bought in and they're not as committed, which then trickles down to an avoidance of accountability because they didn't commit to it. And so there's not really any standard, not really any, any expectation, which then goes to, you know what, I'm just going to work on my own little department over here. And, and I'm more concerned about my own individual and or my team's results than the overarching company's result. And you get silos, you get uh, all sorts of gossiping, you get all sorts of um, kingdom building in a way that's all about me and my ego and less about what is the overarching goal and, and need of the business. So again, those five dysfunctions are absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and inattention to results. There's a visual that we can actually provide because I'm a very visual learner. So if you're listening right now and thinking, ah, we have a visual we can we can send to you if, if you if you're interested. And Nick, I don't know how you want to work the mechanics of that. Yeah, what what we'll do, and um, there's a there's a there's another framework that I want to ask you about, which is made of yeah. it's on the wall in my office. Um, <laughs> and I look at it every day. It's completely changed the way that I lead and the way that I operate. So I'm going to ask you about that. Um, that definitely needs a visual support. So what we'll do, um, we'll put a link in the show notes where everyone can access the visual aids, the visual right. frameworks that we're talking about here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the five dysfunctions that Jeff has just spoken about. And then um, I know that the foundation of all of that, uh, of those five dysfunctions is the the first thing you spoke about which is the absence of trust and i know yeah. that 
you've done a lot more deep work on that and what the yes. key components are uh, when it yes. comes to building trust. So yeah, I'd love to explore that because I think when people hear what those key components are, they're going to be able to realize or identify, here's the things I'm not doing, that yeah. when I start doing them, I'm more likely to get better results in my for business sure. and also create a better experience for my team. Yep, 100%. So you nailed it. I, I've used the five dysfunction from Pat Lencioni, that model for over a decade. But the more I used it, the more I thought, well, if if all of this is based on trust, in particular vulnerability-based trust, we need more data. And, and I need a little bit more meat around trust in this particular model. And it wasn't quite available. There, they were in different places around the world and different books and different podcasts and different speakers and, and so forth but there wasn't enough for me. And so I set out to create a model on it and, and did so and uh, several years ago, I created what I call the triangle of trust that really goes deep on what, what are we talking, what are we talking about when it comes to vulnerability-based trust? And there are, there are three prongs to this triangle. The first one, you won't be surprised uh, based on what we've already shared is vulnerability. And we'll talk about what that is and what it's not. The second one is transparency. Also, we'll clarify what that is. And the third one is consistency. So vulnerability, transparency, and consistency. When you put them together, you build what I call sustained trust, not just trust. Because it's one thing to have a, an element of trust with people, but sustained over time is the really difficult part. And as human beings, we're fallible. We, we mess up all the time. But consistency and, and progress is the key to sustainability in our trust. And if you think about your business, it's all about sustainable growth. We can get to a particular level of, uh, of, of say revenues or profit, but if we, if we can't sustain that, that's our biggest concern in the back of our minds, right? It's like, oh, am I gonna be able to sustain this? Can I, make, can I continue to make payroll? Can I hire people? All the frustration. So sustainability is key and it's based on the foundation of sustainable uh, trust. So before I jump into the model, Nick, anything you want to say or clarify um, that, that the listeners might need to hear? No, I don't think so. Just to reiterate that what you're about to share in the next few minutes has literally changed my life. Um, we're going to provide a visual uh, support for this bit as well. Uh, the link to get that will be in the show notes. And so if all you did was listen to the next few minutes of this podcast and then download the visual support, have it on your wall in your office like I do and look at it every day, <laughs> you'll become twice, three times the leader you already are just automatically. Yeah. And what, what you get with this model is a 10-year shortcut, uh, literally. Uh, and there's so much packed into this model from so many different um, peer review journal, journal articles and Harvard Business Review studies and books and so many things that I've, I've realized this, this really is a great complete model on trust. So on vulnerability, let's jump in. Yeah, what, what I think is interesting is you talk about the three key principles, vulnerability, transparency, consistency. Everyone listening goes, yeah, I know what those things mean. Mm -hmm. I, that seems to make a lot of sense. But I think what we need to talk about now is how do we actually do these things operationally day in, day out in our companies? Yeah, yeah def definitely. It's so true. I, I mean, like, like the age old problem, knowing and doing are very, two very different things, right? How do we actually apply? So, so we'll give a little bit more color to each of these pillars as we go through it. So on vulnerability, what do we mean by that? Well, it means as a leader and anyone else on our team, I can challenge and be challenged. I can ask for help and input versus, well, I'm the leader, I should know it all. Why, if I ask people for help, then people are gonna think that I don't know what I'm doing and or that they'll lose trust in me. Again, it's actually counterintuitive. There's more trust gained when we have the humility to ask for help, especially as a leader. And what's, what is it doing unintentionally and or subconsciously? When we ask for help and set that environment we then naturally mirror the type of behavior that is okay in our company. When we are stoic and we never ask for help or input, then if, if they ask for help or input, then they might be you know, viewed as weak in their mind. Because remember, all of our insecurities are raging in all of our minds. Everybody does. You know, it's, we, we think everybody else has it figured out, but nobody does. 
And so if, if you have that moment where you can't ask for help, you, you just, it, it only validates the need of, yeah, no, I'm good. So that's one. The, the other one is having high emotional intelligence. In particular, we've got to be high on empathy. Um, and what do I mean by empathy? It's, it's beyond just putting yourself in someone's shoes. It's really taking on their mindset and their problems and their insecurities and walking with them and understanding them so that they can feel heard and seen and valued. When they know that they're in that place of safety with you, it's remarkable the walls that go down and the, and the output that they can produce. But if they don't feel valued and heard as a person, they're just a number. They're just kind of there. Then the third component of vulnerability is the ability to not only admit mistakes, but do so publicly for the same reason we talked about for asking for help. You model a behavior that when you mess up, you own it. If you don't own it and you never acknowledge a mistake, which again is the old school way of leading and many people were trained that way, never acknowledge a mistake because you'll look weak, is to then create a, a, an unintentional culture that Nobody will be able to make a mistake here. And if you do, boy, where there'll be some retaliation. There'll be some type of witch hunt. There'll be some type of finger pointing, some type of public shaming. And when we are fearful in our environments, that is when the least sophisticated parts of our brain are actually functioning. The amygdala kicks in, fear, fight or flight. And we are, it's basic, basic knowledge. It's, it's, it puts us on par with most of the other, other animal species in, in, in the animal kingdom, right? What separates us is our prefrontal cortex and our ability to innovate and problem solve and create. But if fear is present in our environment, we don't get to that level of higher thinking. That's why it's so critical. And so therefore the ultimate outcome of vulnerability is psychological safety, as we mentioned before, which creates the best environment for performance. So you can tell I get very passionate about this. <laughs> I could talk about this for, for months and months. My kids would just roll their eyes and move on. Hopefully this is helpful for you. And the, the point is, how can you apply this? Where are you doing this well? Where are areas that you can improve? And what has potentially shifted your thinking? I'd like you to think about that and take action. Nick, anything you'd add there before we go to the next one? No, not at all. I think, um, yeah, everything you just said, uh, you've, you've explained brilliantly. Um, and I think what's probably most common in my experience of working with you know, thousands of business owners over the last decade, um, I think in most companies, this idea of publicly publicly admitting mistakes without fear is what's missing. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of times, the leader or leaders think they've got a culture where mistakes can be publicly admitted, but in actual fact, if you speak to the team members, they have not. So true. So true. And it, it is... It's amazing the blind spots we have as leaders sure. and and what we assume right oh well, sorry it's amazing the blind spots we have as humans right we just we all have them but as leaders even more so uh, we see a particular perspective and we have an autonomy in our business especially as business owners that we assume others think and feel the same and they just don't so yeah and by the way if anyone's watching the video and nick keeps looking to his right it's because that's where he has the triangle of trust on his wall. Right? Exactly. I know that because I've been in your office and I know where you're looking. So it's great. Okay. So the next one is transparency. What do we mean by that? We mean that in essence, when people are armed with data, they make better decisions. When people are in the blind, they are in the blind, right? And, and they feel a little bit more unsure, unsettled. Um, and so, I'm a huge proponent of sharing data uh, openly, um, key data in particular, uh, openly and frequently and honestly. And people ask, well, what does key data mean? Data is sufficient to do their job well. And even beyond that, in that, what are the bigger macro numbers of the company? Where are we headed? Where are we leading? There are some of my clients that will full, share full on p &L with everyone in the company. Some say, ah, the whole P&L, probably not necessary, but our overall revenue target, what our goal is and what our actual is and what that gap is, is important. Or what are our leading indicators to help them? Yes, yeah, so happy to share. We, we share all you know revenue targets and updates uh, with our team and lots of other key data. The P&L, 
we share with our leadership team, but not with the full company. So it really is your choice. Um, but I think the point being most business owners, most entrepreneurs, most leaders don't really share any of the key data. I'm, I'm actually right. amazed whenever, you know, we uh, when we work with a new client, I'm amazed how rare it is that their team have any idea of revenue figures or, you know, yeah. targets, overall company targets. Um, right. It's quite common that individual team members are set certain targets, but without the context of what that's contributing to, it's kind of meaningless. And I think that's why we have, you know, largely in most businesses, um, largely the, the team, the employees are pretty disengaged. For sure. For sure. When, when people can't connect to the why and the bigger picture, it's just a job. Yeah. You just kind of, but when you're part of a meaningful work, which is a big part of this data, there is so much data to suggest how much more people are contributing and how much more productive and how much more happy they are. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's remarkable what data can do to the liveliness, livelihood and the happiness of the individuals that we lead. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So next is by the way, I'm, oh, I'm gonna give you the biggest whenever I talk about this, the biggest pushback I get. But if we share how much revenue or profit we're making, then all the team are gonna come and ask for a pay rise or whatever. That's the biggest yeah, yeah. Right here. So what what do you say? To, or on the flip side, if things aren't going very well, then right. people are gonna freak scared. out yeah. and get scared and uncertain about their about being paid and they might start looking for other work or so like yeah. What's your stance on that? Yeah, uh, this is where a great culture of, with your core values is critical to be able to lean on and to what, what, what environment you're intentionally creating. But to answer more, more directly your two questions, uh, when people have the concern, man, they might want more money, uh, I would teach them the, the principles of running a business and how, how expensive it is. And they may see the revenues and profits and, and to understand, oh, okay, it doesn't all go to the business owner's pocket. But then also to say, teach the principle of risk and reward. The risk that business owners put into creating a business is so massive that most employees don't fully comprehend. And they just expect money to be in their bank account like a machine every two weeks or whenever payday is. Teach them what it is to create a business. Because what you're doing is developing people and you might be developing budding entrepreneurs who might want to go create their own thing in the, in the first place. So just teach them. There's no shame. There's no guilt. And when people find out that there's profit, it's, sure, it's, it's, it's exciting. That I was so scared when I started this business. I wasn't sure if it, would, if it would actually happen. But I'm so grateful it is. And I'm so grateful for you and all of us. And we're, we're making a good income with that. And if it's not sufficient for you, let's figure out what we can do to grow that. Or if it's still not enough, Maybe you want to start your own business and let them be faced with that. Uh, I don't know about that. And then they realize low risk, low reward. I'm good. So, so that's one way I teach that. When it comes to the fear-based side of, man, I don't know if we have enough. Again, teach them. Teach them and trust them and say, but you know what? Here are the brutal facts. We're facing them. But I have an undying belief will prevail. That's called the Stockdale paradox, by the way. Face the brutal facts with an undying belief that you will prevail. That that paradox is set a powerful principle to live and to teach so that you can arm people with emotional resilience which by the way is very applicable in our homes with our with ourselves with our employees it's, it's a great principle and of course in order to be able to do that you actually have to have an unwavering belief that you will prevail <laughs> totally totally so true um okay so so great questions then, then the next part of, of transparency is massive clarity Clarity of what are the goals? What are everyone's individual roles and responsibilities? And there's a whole, there's a separate model that I've created. It's called the three keys of winning that goes really deep into this. In essence, every individual needs to know why their role exists, what success looks like, how it's measured, and by when. When people have that amount of clarity about their role and their goals and so forth and responsibilities, it's amazing what it does for overall trust. With the ambiguity comes fear. So clarity is eradicates the fear. It helps people know where they stand and how they can contribute. When it's ambiguous, when people are finger pointing, when they're not so sure and balls are dropping, typically it's because we as leaders haven't done a good enough job clarifying 
the goals and the roles and the responsibilities. Then the last last thing is authenticity. Just be truly you with no spin. When people aren't sharing the data and they're holding stuff back, human beings have a sixth sense. We just know it. Our BS meters are really, really firing when, when we're talking to someone and we just kind of know, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something here. It's because you're spinning and you're not being authentic. And when that happens, people, that lack of transparency inhibits people from really leaning in. And the outcome of transparency is, is overall unity. A unified team is an unstoppable team. But without transparency, it's really tough for people to unify. All right. On, on the authenticity with no spin, I think that's probably what I was alluding to earlier, where I think most people would say they're honest people and they tell the truth. Yes. Um, yeah. And I guess the sort of difference is, are they saying the things that they may be uncomfortable to say, or are they sharing things that they're uncomfortable to right. share? That's for me, that's the, tr the true definition of authenticity. And that's where I think a lot of people, most people think that they're honest people and they tell the truth, but are they actually practicing yeah. auth authenticity? And I, I think that's probably the gap in most cases, possibly not. Well, so yeah, I think that's a great, great point. Very good point. And we can all think of different leaders. In fact, do me a favor if you're listening, whether you're running or whether you're out, out in the garden or whatever you're doing, think of leaders that you have worked with or for or, over the years when you've just known they're not really giving it to me straight. They're holding back. And look, look at your inability to really commit and be all in and be unified as a team. Because you knew they were holding back. And so there's reciprocity and negativity as well, not only in positivity, where we reciprocate as humans and we hold back as well. And we just don't get the best from people when that happens. Okay, now let's jump to the last one, inconsistency. Actually, this one I've tweaked just a little bit, Nick, over the years. I've, I've There's been more data that I've read and, and researched that this first bullet is a little bit different than I think what's in, on your wall. Not not tons, but but enough. Inconsistency, there are a few components to this that are important. The first one is true competence, competency to know what you're doing, what's, what's happening, because competency breeds true excellence. I used to say reward true excellence, which is important, and there's a couple components. When people are celebrated for showing up and breathing, yay, you've done a great job, high performers get bored with that. Where people want to be Celebrated is when they really do go the extra mile, when they when they create a massively awesome result and they're celebrated for that, that breeds more and more excellence. But on top of that, there's got to be a level of competency in the particular role. If a leader or an individual isn't competent in what they're doing, we are subconsciously judging or sometimes consciously judging, and we don't have a full trust in them because we're not sure if they know what they're doing. But you may go, I what I'm doing. But see, this competency that also combines with the vulnerability, that's where this magic connects. And that's where this triangle of trust, by the, by the way, becomes even more powerful when you start to combine some of these components. So competency is critical. Then the next one is fairness. What do I mean by that? No favorites, no special clubs, no, no unique treatment for gender, religion, sexual orientation, where culture, whatever it may be, but this is a massive blind spot in people. Well, go ahead, Nick. And what you missed off that list, which I think most people understand and go, yeah, uh, again, most people would say, I don't treat anyone any differently based on race, gender, sexual yeah, yeah. orientation, et cetera, or no special treatment of friends or family members that might work in your business. Ask me how For I know example. this. Ask me how I know this, right? And, and, and again, it was never a conscious or deliberate bias. It was completely unconscious that I was having conversations with family members that worked in my company that I wasn't having with other key team members, or I was spending time and doing activities with other members of the team who are really good friends of mine that I wasn't doing as much of that with other members of the team. And so it's mm -hmm. most of, most of the things that you've spoken about here, I don't think anybody would hear and go, Oh, that's not a good idea. I shouldn't do right. that. But most of the time where we're falling short is blind spots. They're not intentional. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think this, the, the, you know, Jeff, I had a lot of work to do on 
fairness, no favourites or special clubs. Not because I'm a bad person or that I didn't care about everybody equally. It was just that I'd got into a situation where there were certain members of the team who I knew better, that had been around longer, and they were getting treated differently than everybody else. Right, right. And I'm just going to share part of that story because it's so painful and so powerful. So background, Nick had had a a leadership team where three of the – Three of the five, or four of the five, had been together for three years plus. A new person gets hired in, and because people know the community, Natalie gets hired, right? And she's the quote-unquote outsider trying to assimilate into this cohesive group that has been together for so long. They could literally finish each other's sentences. I mean, they've been together that long, right? And I'm sitting here, the outsider looking in, going, mm, we got a problem here. There's, there's language, there's behavior that's happening, and it's all a blind spot with people, and they don't see it. And so here we are in a leadership development session. They're all together in a room. I'm on Zoom looking into the room, talking with them, and we're talking about this exact principle, and I can just feel it and see it. And I went there in the most awkward way. And, and I, you know, we were, we were you know, sharing this point, and I said, you know, no, no favorites or, or special clubs. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, elephant in the room um there, there's an issue here and i said you know i'm just going to take a stab at this and i'm just going to guess and i'm going to put words into natalie's mouth and i'm just guessing this is how it might feel and it was already awkward at that point and then i said literally i said this if i'm natalie i'm thinking i feel like an outsider i don't know if i can really be assimilated in this group i i don't feel like people trust me and I'm not even sure if I want to be here anymore. It's that it's that awkward. And Natalie, I realized that said some pretty strong words. Is any of what I just anything that I just shared off at all? Am, am I off in anything that I shared? And you know, you can just drop a pin in that room. It was so silent and so awkward. And Nick's looking at me. I hate you and I love you. <laughs> well, I was actually said, thinking you ahead, better yeah. know you better know what you're doing here. Because this could be a disaster. Fortunately, that's how long it took me to find this talent, and, and she's amazing. And now she might leave. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So, fortunately, it ended wonderfully. And she did confirm and said, I think her exact words were that spot on. Yeah. Which was a bit shocking. And then, you know, immediately everyone in the room kind of felt bad. I was like, oh, we don't mean to do that. But it created an awesome dialogue for us. And then true empathy came in and we just really danced with this triangle of trust. And the outcome has been remarkable, just remarkable. It's been, it's been great. Okay, then the last part of, of consistency is true integrity. And I am such a geek when it comes to this topic. In, a, in other words, I don't think integrity as much about, you know, you think of integrity, you think honesty. You think, um, you know, can I trust you? I, I like to think, and, and it is that. In addition, though, it is, do my actions mirror my words, period. Do I do what I say I'll do, period. Those little things build trust subconsciously so powerfully we don't even realize it. Conversely, those little things when we say we'll do something and we don't erode trust so powerfully we don't even realize it. And think about it. Think of the people that you trust most in your business. I guarantee you they're the ones that you know when they have a deadline or an assignment or a project on their plate, you can exhale. You know it's as good as done because their actions mirror their words. On the opposite, people that you've given a project to and they're just inconsistent with their ability to follow through and actually execute, you don't exhale, you actually hold your breath. You hope that they'll do it. And they typically don't get the most important projects. This is a critical component of trust. Now think of yourself. How often do you do what you say you'll do? And are you perfect? Absolutely not. And again, this is where the model really works well together. Go back to the first step. When we do mess up, which we will, go back to vulnerability of publicly acknowledging the mistake, asking for forgiveness and committing to being better. Notice that this model works in personal relationships as well. (laughs) I mean, it it truly does. This is a life-changing model that enriches our lives, that strengthens relationships and helps people become the better version of themselves. It's why I love it so much. And the outcome of consistency is true commitment. 
So all together, again, we'll give this visual to you as you as you go to the show notes and download it. But it, it's a game changing model. It really is. And I love when people really engage in it and, and, and commit to implementing it the way Nick has amazingly. By the way, those that are listening that are coaches, how much would you love to coach Nick? I'm serious. He is the best coaching client because he implements. He's humble. I mean, he he applies this triangle of trust like a boss. It's amazing. But, you know, as I mean, to the point that he has it on his wall, he's looking at it every day and he's practicing it. That's amazing. So anyway, it's I, I love working with you, Nick, and love learning from you. It's it's amazing. And I love I'm grateful this model has helped you as much as it's helped me. Well, yeah, and I, I appreciate you saying that. And look, I don't get it right all the time. Like nobody's perfect there are still blind spots that are constantly being brought to my attention but having this structure in our business made a huge difference i'm gonna go on a limb if you're listening to this and you've got a team or employees or people in your business who are underperforming this is why i guarantee it i've seen enough i've experienced this enough in my own business i've work with enough people i've hired enough people i've been in and around other companies clients peers colleagues enough that i'm telling you if you feel that your business your team your company is currently underperforming this is the reason why um either because um you have not yet established a base of sustained trust and or there are some of the five dysfunctions that Jeff mentioned earlier at play. Mm -hmm. So two things in closing of this episode. One, um, I'd, if you're a leader, a CEO, a founder of a company, you've got a team of people, I'd strongly recommend that you go to the link in the show notes and download the visual support that Jeff has kindly provided for us. Um, the second thing, um, everything we've spoken about in this episode is the reason why Jeff and I created Eight Figure Mastermind. And so Eight Figure Mastermind um, is a pro project that I've been wanting to do for quite a long time. I'd say for years. <laughs> for years. You know, we've, right. we've, we've had our Six Figure Mastermind. We've had our Seven Figure Mastermind. I I've wanted to create a next level mastermind for seven figure, multi seven figure business owners, um, which we didn't have something specifically for previously. Um, and so Jeff and I are collaborating on that. Essentially, eight figure mastermind is for exclusively for seven figure, multi seven figure, eight figure business owners who want to implement a lot of what we've shared on this podcast and a lot more. Um, so, if you're listening to this and you happen to be that person, you happen to already have a seven figure, a multi seven figure, an eight figure business, and any of this resonates with you, you know that maybe your team is underperforming or, or you're underperforming, you're not performing or getting the results that you know you're capable of. Mm -hmm. um, I guarantee some of what we've shared is the reason why. So um, well, what I would say is if that's you and you'd like some more information about Eight Figure Mastermind, how it all works, um, et cetera, et cetera, then please reach out to me directly. You can drop me an email, nick at expertempires.com uh, or send me a DM on Instagram. Uh, and we'll send all the information over to you. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. I know you've got another session that you're running late for now, so I appreciate you sharing as openly as you always do. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, I'm sure we will do um, episode three of the... Uh, <laughs> we'll make it the Jeff Mask trilogy. Uh, we'll do the third episode at some point in the future, I'm sure. Uh, Jeff, thanks again, as always. Thanks, everyone, for listening. See you soon. You bet. Thanks, everybody.